Awesome. Well, I am super excited to be here sharing with us today, and it's so good to be here with our Knox family, and if you're joining us online, glad you could be here too. But I'm excited because we're in the middle of our school holidays, and parents, some good news for you, there's only one week left. (laughs) One week left, and they're back out of the house. I know all the parents here are ecstatic. The young people, maybe not so much. But for me, as a youth pastor, I'm excited because that means that Epic Youth is getting ever so closer to starting back up again. And I've got the microphone, so I can give that a bit of a plug. So if you're a teenager, best place to be on a Friday night, Epic Youth. But I'm also excited because at the end of these school holidays next weekend, we have got a guest speaker coming to share with us, Leila Narvandi. She is absolutely incredible. She was Dave Hall's youth pastor for over 10 years. Now she's an international preacher, a writer, a Bible teacher, and she ministers to churches and conferences across the world. We had a speaking at Epic Youth last year, and it was such an incredible night where the Holy Spirit just moved through our young people. So really encourage you guys, if you have friends, family, bring them along next weekend to hear Layla speak. It's absolutely amazing. And this is just one of the incredible things that are happening here at City Life Church. You know, we've already had so many awesome things happen, and it's only April. We just had Easter come past, and who enjoyed our Easter presentations? Yes, a resounding yes, amazing. And we've also just finished our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And personally, I love that we even do uh, these 21 days of prayer and fasting because it's such an incredible time for us to come together and unite in prayer, pray corporately. And this year, in our year of shared life, we began our 21 days of prayer and fasting with a prayer encounter night. And that was such an incredible space where we got to come together and pray with one another and pray over the needs of our church, of our communities, our cities, our nations. And, you know, there's something powerful when we come together in prayer. You know, it doesn't need to be a pastor that prays or a leader that prays because each of us can pray. The Holy Spirit lives in each and every single one of us. And I want to encourage us as we're going through this year to continue taking those next steps in our prayer life, to continue growing our prayer journey. You may not know this, but the first Thursday of every month, we actually do a day of prayer and fasting as a church. And we have uh, topics that we all pray together and cover in prayer. And if you wanna join us in that, uh, you can find these on the Sid Life website, the first Thursday of every month. But as we're talking about prayer, you know, what a good way to start today. And why don't you join me as we pray over what's happening. Dear God, we just thank you for today, Lord. And God, we just pray that you would speak to us today. God, whatever troubles are in our minds, whatever is keeping us up at night, Lord, we just surrender that to you right now. God, we pray that you would quiet our our thoughts, you would quiet our hearts. God, that we would be here to hear from you and receive from what you have to say to us, Lord God. So God, we pray that you would speak to each person here today, each person watching online. And God, we just pray that you would move and fill us up. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today I'm talking about being surrounded. And as I say, you know, surrounded, I'm curious as to what thoughts it sparks up in each of our minds. For some of us, it could be some positive thoughts. You know, I'm surrounded by friends, I'm surrounded by family, I'm surrounded by some good food here in Melbourne. I'm sure some of us are already planning our lunch dates right after church. You know, we're surrounded by all these amazing things. And, you know, I acknowledge that some of us being surrounded might not have such a great tone with it. It might make us feel a bit tense, a bit anxious, we might feel a bit claustrophobic, I'm surrounded by problems, or I'm surrounded by strangers, or I'm just surrounded by challenges everywhere I look. See, for me, when I hear the word surrounded, the first thing that pops in my mind is uh, our Australian national anthem. It's a bit of a weird one, but stay with me. See, growing up, every week in school assembly, we would sing the Australian national anthem, and it would get to that one line, our home is girt by sea. I've never known what the word girt means. We don't use it in a lot in our normal language. We probably should, it's, I think it's a great word. But I went home and I did some research, I looked it up, and girt has two specific meanings. See, the first meaning, it means to surround or to encircle. So our home is surrounded by sea. You know, that, that makes sense. We're an island, continent. There's water around us. Don't correct my geography, I don't know how the words work. But we are surrounded by water. The second meaning that the word lends itself to comes from its root word, gird. And to gird something, to undergird, to build a girder, it means to reinforce, to support, to prepare for something difficult or something challenging. 
And I think that's a great reminder for us as a church that no matter what season we're in, we should constantly be preparing ourselves, constantly be getting ready for what the future holds, for what challenges are coming next, for what difficulty is about to face us. Because in the world we're living in, we are surrounded. We are surrounded by so much. All you have to do is turn on the news to see all these different events that are happening across the world, across our city, even in our local communities, things are going on. And the question is, with all of these things, all these events, even in our own personal lives, when things start popping up, are we prepared? Are we ready to face them? Are we ready to stand our ground when these things come to us? And that's why I love that our church engages in these 21 days of prayer and fasting at the start of the year. It's a great time for us to come together and pray and acknowledge that no matter what challenges face us, God is one that is in control. God is one that is fighting. God is one that has won the victory. We are under his banner. You know, we come together and we pray and we acknowledge all these and we also ask God for his wisdom, his guidance as we try to navigate this year. But my question is when we ask God to speak to us, and he does, how do we recognize his voice? Are we prepared to recognize when God is speaking to us? You know, with all the things that are going on in our world, all the different desires that's happening, can we recognize when God's speaking to us? See, my son has just turned 10 months old, and some of you are shocked that I'm even mature enough to have a child. Um, <laughs> that's why I grow the mustache. But my son has just grown, and he's turned 10 months old, and it's amazing, he's at that stage where he's so alert, with life. You know, we take him out and he's just taking in the wonders of the world. He's seeing everything and you begin to notice all the different things that fight for his attention. Every bright screen, every light colored poster, every loud noise, he's sort of whipping his head back and forth like a meerkat trying to find out what is stimulating him the most. And even when we come into church or we go into public places, you can see him sort of look at everyone's face and it's a bit creepy because he stares you right in the eyes with drool out of his mouth and he's trying to process, do I know who you are or not? But even when he's in a busy place like church, you know, what I find incredible is that all it takes is if he hears my voice or the voice of my wife or he sees our faces, he instantly knows that it's his parents speaking to him. He starts to look around to see where his mom and his dad are. You know, in John 10, 4, it says that his sheep follow him because they know his voice, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from a stranger because they don't recognize the stranger's voice. With my child, it kind of goes both ways. Not only does he recognize my voice, but when we're in church and there's a, a scream or a cry in the back of the auditorium, I know it's mine. It's always mine. Every single time it's mine. But God knows us just as intimately, if not more intimately. He knows our cries, he knows our voices. He knows when we speak to him, when we pray to him, when we call out to him, he knows us all so intimately and he loves us just as intimately as well. He cares for us so much that he would leave the 99 to pursue the one. See, Jesus continues in verse 11, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and he doesn't own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he flees. The wolf attacks the flock, it scatters it, and the man runs away because he has a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. And I wonder if there's times in our lives where we find ourselves putting our trust, our, our hope, our security in these hired hands. You know, these short-term solutions, these temporary moments of happiness. And I'm guilty of this too. You know, maybe if I just advance my career a little bit, then all my problems will go away. Maybe if I just get into that relationship, then things start looking up. Maybe if I just, you know, get what I need to. Maybe if I buy these new things, then my problems will solve. Maybe if I change this about myself, then all my problems will disappear. But when the wolf comes, when the things start going wrong, when all these events start popping up in our lives and we're not ready. The things we're holding on to, these hired hands, they disappear just as quickly. But the good news is that we have this loving God who cares for us so much that he would push past all of this noise just to be with us. And here Jesus, he reveals himself as the good shepherd. And what separates a good shepherd from a bad shepherd? Well, if you put yourself in the shoes of someone who owns sheep, you're in the field and you have this flock that you're taking care of and you see 
a wolf coming and he's got this ravenous look in his face and you know that it's either you or the sheep. See, many shepherds would look at their sheep and all they would see is wool, meat, money. It would be inventory, it would be, it'd be stock, it'd be things that you own. So why would you lay your life down for that? If my life is forfeit, how can I reap any benefits from anything that these sheep can give me? These sheep don't benefit me at all other than what I can use on them. See, but Jesus comes as the good shepherd and he says, I know that I don't get any benefit from these sheep, but I will still lay my life down because I care for my sheep that much. See, and Jesus continues in verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. See, we're the sheep of Jesus, and he loves us so much, he cares for us so much, but we're not called to keep that to ourselves. We're called to actually go out into the world, to invite other people into this flock, to invite them into this relationship with Jesus. In fact, in Matthew 10, 16, Jesus says, just quite blatantly, behold, I send you out as sheep amidst the wolves. Be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. We're being sent into this world that is full of trouble, full of wolves, full of things that are waiting to attack us as his sheep. And the reality in life is there's always gonna be challenges, there's always gonna be problems, there's always gonna be attacks that try to draw us away from the shepherd. And when we think of the word attacks, we think something very intense, something very aggressive, but it's not always that way. It could be something as small as a, a distraction or a, a temptation or even just a, a frustration. You know, for those of you who engage in these 21 days of prayer and fasting, you might relate to this, but it feels like every time we're about to engage in this fast, something pops up that sort of tries to pull you away. You know, maybe you started the fasting season being like, I'm not gonna eat any junk food. You know, that is my commitment. I'm gonna fast junk food. And then you look at your phone and the Macca's app has got amazing deals for the whole month. And you're like, well, I can fast next month. That's okay, Jesus forgives. Or maybe you're fasting technology and you're saying, you know, I'm not gonna watch any TV. I'm not gonna open my screens at all. And then suddenly a new season of your favorite show has just popped up on Netflix and you have to avoid spoilers for a whole month. Otherwise, you'll miss out on getting that excitement from the show. It's these little things that keep popping up that try to draw us away. You know, we're God's sheep and the reality is that even though we're following God, life does not get easier. In fact, it kind of makes us more of a target in this world. But we take solace knowing that we have a God who has won this victory, who is fighting for us. And when you follow God, the enemy tries to attack us in all these different ways. It tries to disrupt us, to distract us, to pull us away from this flock, this shepherd that we're with. And it does it in all sorts of manners through loss through pain, through hardships, and through even apathy, frustrations, procrastination, all these different ways. It will try whatever means that it can because it is fighting for its life. It is fighting this spiritual battle, this spiritual war that we are caught in. So what do we do? How can we fight in this battle? Well, Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. See, we're not stepping into a spiritual battle. We are already in a spiritual battle. And I don't know about you, but if I'm in a battle, if I'm in a war, if I'm in a fight, I wanna be prepared as possible. I wanna make sure I have everything at my fingertips ready to go. And there's times when we try to prepare in our own strength, our own wisdom, things that make sense to us. Maybe if I just gather enough savings and my finances are secure, then you know the next problem comes, I'll I'll be okay, I'll I'll be able to manage. Or maybe if I just invest more in this relationship and then something pops up and maybe I'll be able to handle it because I've got someone there with me. These are all preparations of this world, but that's not where our struggle is. That's not where the fight is. So how can we fight against this? Well, he continues, therefore put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, you can stand. 
See, at the time of writing this, Paul would have been imprisoned in a Roman jail and he would have seen soldiers of the Roman army walking past day in, day out, these Roman guards, and they would be wearing their armour, holding their equipment, their weapons, and he would use this as the inspiration for this illustration of the armour of God. And, you know, it's interesting that these soldiers, these guards, they weren't on the front lines of battle. They weren't in the midst of the war. They were back at home. They were presumably safe in the prison, but yet they would still wear their armour. They would still hold their weapons in their hands. You know, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who remembers going to kids' church and learning about the armour of God, the various songs, the various crafts that we do. But today I want to unpack the armour just a little bit. And to help me, I've graciously borrowed, stolen, some props from kids' church. Um, Thank you, Pam and the kids' team for lending this to me. But I want to go through these and it starts off Coming back to that word, good, or good, to good yourself, to surround yourself, to prepare yourself. Has anyone heard of what a girdle is? A girdle? For those of you who don't know, a girdle is a type of belt that you put around your waist and it turns your keg into a six pack. It kind of sucks everything in. I definitely haven't looked at buying one for myself, but it begins with a gird. This belt of truth is where it all starts off with and it's a bit opposite of how we do things. You know, when you think of wearing belts nowadays, belts are the accessory. Once you've got your whole outfit on, you put the belt on last and make sure it matches up. But here Paul tells us, put the belt on first. And the reason being is when you would wear your armour, you would still have your clothes underneath. But if your clothes were loose, if they were baggy, if they were shifting around your cloak and your robe, then when you put that armour on, your armour wouldn't sit well. It would shift, it would move. And in the midst of battle, the last thing you want is to be lopsided or being swayed by the extra weight that your armour carries. So put on your belt first, tighten up your clothes, tighten up what you are and prepare yourself for battle. Don't just get ready to put on your armour for show, but ready to move in it. See, this belt of truth, it starts with that. Doing this truthfully, doing this authentically coming to a place of saying, I'm gonna put on this armor in preparation for battle, not just to stand there and look pretty. Next up is the breastplate of righteousness. Doesn't fit me, these are for five-year-olds, just clarifying. (laughs) The armor would be a lot bigger. But the breastplate of righteousness, it it would cover your chest, it would cover your most important organs, your heart, the breath in your lungs. And the thing about this righteousness is it's not our righteousness, it's not human righteousness, it is the righteousness that comes from God, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, knowing what is right and what is wrong. But you notice that when you look up Roman armour, or particularly the breastplate, most of the reinforcement is on the front. See, on the back, it would clasp together, there would be straps, there'd be not as much reinforcement, there'd be some weak points, because when you are faced in battle, when your enemy is ahead of you, Why would you ever turn your back on that? Why would you let your enemy get a free shot where you are vulnerable? In the same way, when we see injustice, when we see things that are wrong, we should not be turning our back on them, but instead we should be facing them head on with the armour of God. Next is the readiness that comes from the gospels of peace placed upon our feet. See, it doesn't matter how well armoured or how prepared our body is, If our feet are are injured, if our feet are vulnerable, then we can easily be taken out of battle. If you've ever had a stone in your shoe, you know exactly how uncomfortable that is, how disorienting it is to even try to walk, let alone fight. You know, maybe you walked in today in this wet weather and your socks are wet. I'm sure that 80% of today, that's all you've been thinking about is these just gross, wet socks. But a prime example is you look at Ned Kelly, or Achilles, the Greek warrior. Two warriors who fought numerous battles, but they were both taken out by an injury to the foot. See, what does this readiness mean? It means being prepared when God calls us to move, getting ready for action that at a moment's notice, we're ready to march or to move into the space where God has convicted us to. At no point in battle do you want the enemy in front of you and saying, hold on, can I just tie my shoelaces real quick? Just don't attack me just yet, I just need to fix this up. We need to be ready to move at a moment's notice. See, next is our helmet of salvation. The helmets they used were a bit more sturdy than this, I admit. Um, But this is a good example of what it looks like. 
Did I just break the microphone? All right, don't wear the helmet, good note. So, the helmet of salvation. This goes on your head, it protects your mind, it protects your thoughts, it protects you from discouragement, attacks to the way you think, but it also keeps your focus in front of you. It has sort of a limited view to make sure that you are staring your enemy straight down, that you're not letting them out of your sight. But you notice on the top, it also has this insignia, this marking, and this would let you know that when you are standing in an army, it would tell people whose kingdom you are fighting for, who is standing on your side of this war, who is fighting alongside you. See, next is one of my favorite parts. It is the shield of faith. And this is what we use to defend ourselves, our shields. And when we think of Roman shields or we think of shields in general, we think of you know, something like this, nice and portable, easy to carry, or maybe those triangular ones that medieval knights used or these circles that were made popular by all these gladiator movies. But the reality is that the Roman soldiers, they would carry these large rectangular shields that were made of wood. They would go from head to feet and they would march into battle and interlock their shields one by one to create this almost impenetrable wall that when arrows, when stones, when projectiles were flung at them, that it would just merely bounce off these shields. But notice that Paul says that lift up your shield to protect you from the fiery arrows of the evil one. See, the enemies of the Roman Empire, they would know that arrows, that stones, that they would be completely ineffective against these large wooden shields, this almost turtle-like shell that they would protect themselves with. So what the enemies began to do is they would begin to light their arrows on fire before they let them loose. And the idea isn't that a flaming arrow could then penetrate these shields, but once a flaming arrow hits these shields made of wood, it would cause the wood to catch on fire and the goal was to get the Roman army to throw their shields in a panic and leave them vulnerable, leaving them open to attack, leaving them defenseless. See, and lastly is the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God, our, our Scripture, our Bibles. See, a Roman soldier would spend years practicing with his sword, with his techniques, his strikes. He would be so familiar with his weapon, it would become a part of his self. It would be an extension of his body. He would know the exact weight of his sword. He would know where the balance point is. Rarely would you ever throw someone into battle, hand them a sword with zero experience and expect them to actually win a fight. See, in the same way, when we look at our, our swords, our Bibles, our scriptures, are we as familiar with them as we should be? Are we as practiced as we should be? Or do we only pick them up when we are in the desperate needs of battle? Are they as familiar that they're a part of our lives, of our body? See, we look at Jesus in the wilderness. When the enemy is trying to tempt him, Jesus uses scripture, verses in Deuteronomy to combat the lies of the enemy. But what's interesting is if you look at what the enemy says, what the tempter says, he actually tries to use scripture and twist it to trick Jesus. See, when the enemy does that, when the wolf in sheep's clothing comes and twists the word of God, are we so prepared that we know when our weapon has been tampered with? That our sword, our, our word of God isn't being used correctly? Are we so familiar with the word that we can pick that up on a moment's notice? See, if we don't prepare ourselves, we make ourselves vulnerable. So put on the full armor of God. You know, a few years ago before the pandemic, I had a friend's bucks party and one of the events that we did was going paintballing. I'm not sure if anyone here has been paintballing before, but it is painful. So I think that's where the word pain comes from in paintballing. And when you go paintballing, they give you very limited protection. You get a helmet and you get this sort of one piece overall cloth that goes from your ankles to your wrists. You can buy extra protective gear. You can buy you know, shoulder pads, knee pads, arm guards, all these sorts of things. But we thought, yeah, we're not weak. We're not wusses. Let's, let's take it like real men. Biggest regret of my life. But because this was a box party, one of the ceremonious events is that the groom-to-be would have to run through this obstacle course without any of this protective gear on. Only in his T-shirt, his shorts, and a little mask that protects his face. But he would have to run down this obstacle course while the rest of us made a guard of honor, you know, very respectful, and we got to fire as many paintballs as we can at him as he made his way through. 
But the thing is that once he made his way to the end of this course, he would have to stand still as we unloaded the rest of what we had of our paintballs on him. And as he's being explained this, you could see the fear and the sheer panic in his eyes. He's trying to strategize how he's going to get through. At one point, he just crawls up into the fetal position on the ground, hoping we don't see him. Um, it wasn't good for him. But he managed to crawl away from that day quite battered and bruised. But I'm curious to think, if he had that protective layer on, if he got every single additional piece of armor of protection on his body, when it came to the part to stand his ground and take those bullets, would he still have the same amount of fear in his eyes? See, when we're wearing the full protection, the full armor of God, we can stand confidently knowing that, yeah, these blows may come, but we won't feel the impact as much. So are we surrounding ourselves with this armor of God? Because all we have to do is actually stand. So when you have this armor on and you're fully protected, you aren't worried about what the enemy's throwing at you because you are so well defended that you can stand. And that's why Paul says, stand. And it's a bit counterintuitive to prepare yourself for battle, to have your weapons, your shields, only to do nothing. But we're not the ones fighting this war. See, God is fighting for us. He calls us to stand and to stand firm, not to cower, not to doubt, not to prepare to flee in anticipation of losing, not to slouch and despair knowing that the enemy is gonna win, but to stand firm, to be ready to move at a moment's notice. In fact, 2 Corinthians 10 says, so though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. In fact, we have divine weapons that can demolish strongholds. So are we prepared to stand against what is coming at us? Because the curious thing is, when you've got all this armor on, it doesn't stop any of these attacks from coming. It doesn't instantly make you invulnerable or, or stop you from being a target at all. It actually just helps you stand your firm ground, knowing full confidently that you can stand against the attacks of the enemy. Because in life, there's always gonna be moments when we're attacked when the enemy tries to disrupt us, to throw us off, to get us to throw that shield away in a panic. Because we're fighting a battle that is not of flesh and blood, but of something more in this world. You know, in school, I, I did a project in wolves, and the way that wolves hunt is they track their prey over long distances, they tire them out. And when their prey is finally tired and exhausted, they isolate them from their pack, from their herd, from their group. And then the wolves, they surround their prey. They begin to attack from multiple angles. See, the strength in a, a wolf isn't due to the one wolf, but it's actually to the number of them, the overpowering they use, the way they catch their prey off guard. You know, I know in the moments of my life when I look back and it's been the hardest, it's never been one thing that's gone wrong. It's been multiple things in multiple areas of my life. And I'm sure many of us can relate. You know, you wake up in the morning and maybe you stub your toe or you spill your coffee and you've just felt that over sense of dread that it's gonna be one of the worst days imaginable. See, the enemy attacks. He goes after these small things. He begins to chip away at your mind, your thoughts, your attitude, and he begins to make you doubt, to panic. And I've been there in these moments where it's difficult to even put on this armor to make it on your shoulders. It just feels like a heavy burden, but that's where we have the Roman soldiers. They had armor bearers. They had brothers and sisters by their side who would help them prepare for battle and then stand with them with their shields interlocked. So when you have one person in armor, it's an effective fighter, but when you've got a whole line of them, that is an effective army. And when you surround yourself with friends or maybe a life group, people around you who are also wearing the armor of God and they're prepared to do life with you, you can start standing confidently in battle knowing that there are people by your side. Because it makes a world of difference when you have people surrounding you, people who are ready to jump in, people who are ready to journey with you in whatever you're going through. And I wanna take a moment just to demonstrate this and see how effective this is. I'm gonna have a bit of space of vulnerability right now, so bear with me. But many of us know the song, How Great Is Our God? How great is our God? Like quiet nods, yes? Awesome. Well, I'm gonna take a moment. I'm gonna invite you all to close your eyes. Just across this room. If you're online, you can close your eyes and well. But I'm gonna sing the chorus of How Great Is Our God. Now, I'm not a singer, 
so please don't uh, judge me too harshly. But as I sing this song, I don't want you to focus on my voice or the words I'm singing or the notes I'm hitting, but I want you to listen to the space in the room, to the atmosphere in this room. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will sing, how great, how great is our God. And then with your eyes closed, I'm gonna sing that one more time. But I invite each and every single one of us here, and if you're watching online as well, to join with me as we sing this chorus to sing these words nice and loud. And again, don't focus on the words or getting them right. Don't focus on hitting the right notes or focus on the voice of the person next to you. But as you're singing these words, again, listen to the room. Listen to the atmosphere that is created. Let's sing. How great is our God. Sing with me. You can open your eyes. See how much of a world of difference it makes when other people jump in, when they stand with you, when they journey alongside you. See, one person gets the job done, but Multiple people just make it fuller. See, I could sing the song and the words would come out, the, the notes would come out, but when we're singing together, it doesn't matter if someone forgets the words or someone sings off key, we all fill in the void together. Now, when we read our Bibles and we delve into the Word, we can read it on our own and that's great, but when we come together in our life groups, when we do our Bible studies with another person, we get insights that we never thought of. We get wisdom, we get other life experiences shared and it makes the experience so much better. When we pray, it's good to have that prayer life with God, that personal relationship, but when we pray with one another, something powerful happens. We can encourage each other, we can build each other up, we can edify each other. In Ephesians 6, it continues, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. So we've got to put on this armour. We've got to surround ourselves with this armour, but also surround ourselves with our brothers and sisters who are doing the same thing. But it all starts with this belt of truth. Maybe being honest with our partners or our friends or our family, our life group and saying, actually, yeah, I could use some prayer this week. Maybe it's even being honest with ourselves. We've tried so hard to do things our way to, to be in control, but maybe it's time to say, God, I I've, I've can't do this anymore. I need your help. It all begins with this moment of honesty and it's daunting, it's intimidating to even say, I need prayer. But James 5 says, if anyone is in trouble, pray. If anyone is rejoicing, then sing songs of praises. And if anyone is sick, pray for them. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. You now, maybe right now you're feeling like you're surrounded, like life's closing in on you, that everywhere you look, there's problems, there's issues, things keep going wrong and they're not the way you want them to go. And maybe there's a lot of pain, there's hurt, there's shame or frustration, you're finding it difficult to even think about putting on this armour of God. Now maybe you even know someone in your life who has been going through such a difficult time, they're struggling and maybe this is an opportunity to stand with them, to pray with them. Now let's surround ourselves, let's surround our brothers and sisters, let's surround our family, our friends, instead of letting the world surround us. See, iron sharpens iron, but armour and shields work best when they're together. And we learnt over the Easter season, we're reminded that Jesus is walking with us no matter where we're at, but He's also placed people in our lives to journey with us as well. 
And this last verse I want to leave you with, Ecclesiastes 4. Many of us would have heard this at weddings or at marriages, but it says, two is better than one. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and there's no one to help them. If two lie down, they can keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And this moment, I wanna ask us to do something brave, something powerful, as to come together as one cord, as one flock, as one church. And it's gonna sound a bit intimidating, but I'd love for us to pray for the person sitting next to us. Maybe it's someone you have known a long time or maybe it's someone you just met during greeting time, but I wanna encourage us to take that step of boldness and pray for the person sitting next to us to be those brothers and sisters in arms, to help one another put on that shield. And if you're not comfortable sharing your prayer request, that's okay, you don't have to. We just love to pray over you. And maybe you're sitting a bit far out. We encourage you, move in. If you wanna pray in a group, you can do that as well. If you're watching online, if you type your prayer request down below, our online family would love to pray with you. Noel and Melford would love to pray with you as well. But we'd love to take just a couple of minutes if we could all just pray for our neighbour. Care for them. Show them that God's love. So we'll take a couple of minutes just now and I'll come back in just a moment. God. God, we just lift up all these prayer requests to you, Lord. God, we lift up every heart, every name, every thought. God, we just surrender to you right now. God, we pray that as we leave this place, Lord, that you would convict us. God, that we would stand firm, knowing that you have won the victory, that we would stand with our brothers and sisters. God, we pray that you would help us through this week. God, that you would remind us of your goodness 
of your faithfulness that when the enemy tries to attack us, to cause us to panic, God, we pray that we would stand firmly knowing that you are there with us. God, throughout this week, let us put on that armour, Lord. Let us encourage one another. Let us strengthen one another. Let us stand with our brothers and sisters in confidence knowing who you are in our lives. God, we just lift up every single person to you today, Lord. Whether they're here, whether they're online, whether they're at home, God, the people in our hearts, we just surrender them to you and your will. God, we just thank you for what you are doing in each and every single person here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're still praying, you can continue, but I'll invite you all to stand as we're gonna enter into more time of worship right now. But before we begin, I would love to leave you with this one final thought. So we spoke about the, the Good Shepherd and we hear about leaving the 99 sheep for the one. But I wanna challenge us as a church today. What if those 99 sheep cared so much for the one? What if they looked after the one? What if they prayed for the one? What if they supported the one so much that that one never had to look for anything more outside? What if those 99 sheep embodied the heart of their shepherd? I'll leave you with that thought. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, this is how I find my battles. 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 Sing, this is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. And this is how I find my. Let's sing, declare. This is how I find my battles. Yeah, this is how I find my battles. Yeah, this is how I find my battles. Oh, this is how, this is how. And this is how I find my battles. And this is how I find This is how I find my 